Well, hello everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us for a discussion on the state of play in the vector arms race, perspective on the future of gene delivery. My name is Amber Tong and I'm an editor at Endpoints News. Now for everyone who's watching this panel, no matter where you stand or in your choice of vector, I'm guessing it starts from the same place. You have patients in mind with a genetic defect and you want to deliver a gene to fix that. But depending on what gene it is, where you want it, how much of it you need, and many other questions, you end up making different decisions. So while it's much more fun to pit rival approaches against each other, in this coming hour, I was hoping to construct this mental Venn diagram together so that we can get a clearer picture on where the overlaps are between different approaches and where they're charting their own paths. Unfortunately, I won't be the one doing the heavy lifting. Joining me today are CEOs of three leading gene therapy companies, each representing a unique technology for gene delivery. First, we have Asa Abeliovich from Prevail Therapeutics, which is working on adeno-associated viruses, or AAV. Then we have Jeff McKay from AvroBio, which is developing lentiviral-based treatments. And we'll call him AvroJeff for the panel because we also have Jeff McDonald from Generation Bio, whom we'll call Generation Jeff, telling us about their new class of non-viral gene therapies. So to start us off, um, since technologies are evolving every day and AAV or Lenti or non-viral delivery today isn't what it was even a year ago, I wanted to invite our panelists to bring us up to speed to talk about where your platform technology is now, what you can do with it, and for a couple of you, what you have learned from your clinical data. So why don't we start off with Avro Jeff, um, who's joining us from Boston. Okay, thank you, Amber. So I'll, I'll make some general Lenti points before I get into to Avro. I, I, I have to say that I, I think that Lenti is in a really good spot today. And we can begin by saying that lentiviral gene therapies are beginning to be validated across a number of unique clinical indications. And, and if we focus in rare disease, because of course we could roll in CAR T's, you know, which would add thousands of, of patients to the mix. But if you limit the discussion to monogenic disease, I, I still think that we can begin to make some general statements. Is, is first of all, transformative, and in some cases, curative long-term efficacy has been shown. And you know, just without getting into all of the data, I think we're all aware of multiple inherited blood disorder indications which are either close to or have been approved, multiple primary immunodeficiencies, and, and a growing list of other monogenic diseases like Wiscott Aldridge or, or MLD. And, and the track record is, is pretty impressive. And again, carving out oncology, we, we estimate that there's now over 350 patients, and we've recently added that up to be well over 1,000 patient years of, of data with ex vivo lenti gene therapy. And so I think you can begin to say that we're at a point where we can say with confidence that it is translating in, into durable efficacy. And um, in terms of what have been the learnings to, to get here, I, I think one, one that I would call out, which is kind of part of what's fun about building and, and managing a, a lenti company is, is that the R&D um, sometimes feels like you're, you're the pilot of a plane with, with only a few gauges in, in the cockpit. And, and in our world, that really translates into vector copy number, transduction efficiency, the cell dose, and the intensity of conditioning. And in the early, early academic days, sometimes some of those gauges weren't right. And you know some of the early inherited blood disorder data, for example, didn't translate beautifully. But what really is emerging as a picture is that if you can just get those four gauges right, a decent enough VCN, transduction, cell dose, and conditioning, it is translated in an incredibly consistent way to durable effectiveness. You know, so, so I think that's sort of the general state. Now, how does, how does Avro fit into, into that? I think um, Lenti is interesting because there's not you know, a, a million players in Lenti. I mean, there's, there's groups like Bluebird Bio and ourselves and Rocket and Orchard. What we've done to date is we're early in our journey, but we have dosed four patients across, excuse me, 12 patients across four separate clinical trials. 
And um, so we're certainly not at the point where we can draw real heavy concrete conclusions. But if we do interpret our data, we can say that so far, 12 out of 12 patients are, are showing what we would hope to see, which is um, a, a pretty clear signal that the effect of the gene therapy is, is doing its job, solid efficacy, and going out as far as almost three years in at least one patient and a couple years in multiple patients, we're seeing the same type of durability that has already been demonstrated by others for lentigene therapy. And the safety profile is, is within expectations. Most of our data, nine out of the 12 patients is Fabry. So that's our lead indication. And that's where the bulk of the conclusions come from. And you know, just without getting heavy into the data, we can say that the patients that have withdrawn from ERT, which was their standard, their default, remain off. All of them with, that have discontinued remain off. There's a pretty solid, consistent set of biomarker data in terms of enzyme up, substrate down, uh, really impressive kidney substrate data, which we imagine will be the primary endpoint for a registration trial. And then as we get further out, we can start to look at functional measures and we're seeing a real stabilization of things like EGFR. So the best we can say right now is that we're, we're certainly on track in our early trials and Avro is really at the point now of just trying to focus on clinical execution across these four trials to, to generate more data and continue to, to quantify the profile. Great, <clears throat> thanks Jeff. Um, next, should we move on to um, Asa who's joining us from New York? Oh, uh, I think you're still on mute. Thank you and, and thanks so much Amber and Di. A, a great opportunity here to, to talk about the different op, uh, options available. And, and we really feel like um, that, you know, the, the, the vector choice, the technology platform choice is, is, is very much dependent on the context and what the patients uh, need in the different indications. And, uh, you know, you know Prevail's approach is, I think, uh, uh, clear in that regard. We, so our mission has been from the, from the start to, to focus on developing disease-modifying gene therapies for the major neurodegenerative disorders of aging, so Parkinson's, dementia, such as frontemporal dementia, and, and some uh, pipeline products that include also uh, allied pediatric indications, such as neuropathic Gaucher disease. And so, you know, the, these are first and foremost, you know, the urgent unmet needs. There are no disease modifying therapies for any of these. They're challenging in that one has to get very broad distribution throughout the CNS. Uh, and and, uh, and for, for that, in that regard, um, AV and particularly AV9 has, has really uh, stood out and been transformative. So as you know, a single one-time lifetime treatment with a drug such as Zolgensmus commercial product for SMA type 1 kids um, from, from Vexus Novartis, as, as you know, it can be life-saving and, uh, and has, has shown, you know, very, very clear safety uh, as well. There's, we, we estimate about a dozen or more uh, different products, uh, clinical studies ongoing uh, with just with the AV9 technology. And, and well over, uh, we believe over 500 patients have been dosed uh, with, with AV9, um, you know, with really, really very compelling safety uh, in, in, in patients. Um, so, you know, so of course that's, th this is foremost to us and we, we saw a need to move forward quickly. Uh, we set up <clears throat> about three years ago, there were patients out there with these uh, diseases and, um, and, and we wanted to be able to push ahead. Now, our, our strategy, we have a pipeline and our strategy is really at this a precision medicine approach really as you outlined. So we identified, uh, or Genes have been identified uh, uh, for these diseases, such as Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, the you know a, a number of causative genes have been clearly identified. For instance, with Parkinson's, we're focused on glucosidase gene, which is the uh, the single most important gene we believe. Um, uh, and, and something like about nine to ten percent of Parkinson's patients have an underlying uh, mutation in in GBA1, uh, and, and this is one of the best understood genes in the human genome, we understand the genetics 
uh, exquisitely well and we understand the biology. Um, so we know what we need to do. We need to deliver this gene. We need to deliver it broadly uh, to the CNS of these patients. The patients are out there and um, just uh, made sense to take a, a validated platform that could deliver. We, we deliver into the cerebrospinal fluid as, as do a number of groups uh, now using AV technologies because that is more efficient and, uh, and, and, uh, and has appeared more uh, effective. And across the different programs in the CNS, AVs have shown remarkable durability, uh, probably because the cells are not uh, turning over. Uh, and so, you know, this, this, uh, th this uh, general profile of, you know, it's, it's a single one-time lifetime treatment, uh, great durability, very, you know, broad distribution, uh, and, and, a, and a safety record, you know, makes it clear that for, for our indications from what we're trying to achieve, AV9 uh, is a platform really stands out. And then, you know, we're just super excited about the early data we have. We, we now have uh, two clinical stage products. We have uh, uh, AV9 to deliver uh, the glucosubrosidase gene for patients with Parkinson's disease and GBA1 mutations. We also use that for a second pediatric indication, a rare uh, disease called neuropathic uh, Gaucher disease, which is a devastating um, early early onset uh, disease due to the mutations in the same GPA1 gene. And then we have uh, uh, progranulin AV9 that we deliver for patients with frontotemporal dementia with progranulin mutations. And we do have now uh, early data from uh, the first couple of patients that we treated with PR001 uh, and, and uh, really thrilled about how that looks. So, um, so these are both patients who at baseline had undetectable levels uh, of, of um, glucosubrosidase enzyme activity in their, uh, in their CSF uh, as expected. And uh, at, at the last time point we have, which is at this point uh, three to four months, um, those, those levels were fully normalized. So in the middle of the normal range. Uh, and and w first of all, what that means is that um, is that our preclinical dose finding studies very much translated into clinical, uh, into, into clinical data. And, and it really validates the platform. And then specifically for, for, that, for that program, we're thrilled because our preclinical data on the human genetics pointed toward a 20 to 30% of normal levels as being efficacious and, and, and full normalization as being really upside. And uh, ideal. So you know, again, we're we're thrilled. But the early days, as as Jeff uh, pointed out, and I, I think uh, you know, at this point, um, I think we're we're happy about where uh, where we are with with this platform. But again, it's very much specific to a given, I think, context and, and indication. Yeah. Thanks so much, Asa. And finally, we have um, Generation Jeff, who's also in Boston. I have a feeling we're never going to move past these nicknames. They're, they're too good. I'm, I'm cherishing them already. <laughs> Amber, thank you for hosting this panel. It's uh, really a blast to be here. And uh, the resonance of hearing, Jeff, about your progress in Fabri, which is where I started my career at Genzyme well over a decade ago, this is the dream, you know, that, that patients uh, didn't, didn't know to have, you know, at that time. So it's incredibly exciting what you're up to. And Asa, for your part, I mean, the GBA, uh, um, you know, the impact of GBA or the correlation at that time, the hypothesis that it would show up in, uh, in these neuropathic diseases more broadly was, was just that, it was a guess. So to see you in, in the clinic is truly thrilling uh, as well. And of course, all those insights came out of the Gaucher world originally, right? So, and you know, that kind of touches on the theme of, of this panel. Um, you guys are both building at the cutting edge of a field that's been maturing you know, over 20, 30 years. And, and that's a really important kind of context and cycle to have in mind. I, I think I would say we're at the beginning of another maybe 30 year cycle, which is to try to develop a series of approaches that can allow for non-viral delivery of, of nucleic acid therapies. And, you know, that's really begun in the siRNA and, and mRNA fields, um, primarily using conjugate technology and LNP delivery systems. And the challenge of Generation Bio has been to figure out how to get some of the benefits of what both Jeff and Asa have been speaking about, which is the opportunity to do 
gene replacement in the context of the nucleus, whether in a therapeutic cell or, or in, a, in a native cell type. And the non-viral field has really been stymied by um, two primary challenges. One is how to get uh, DNA constructs uh, or therapeutic nucleic acid constructs into the nucleus without use of the capsid uh, and have them uh, reside there over the long term and, and drive uh, high levels of, of expression. And the second challenge uh, has been the, the delivery and sy systemically, how do you get uh, these constructs uh, to the nucleus of, of cells of interest? So Generation Bio was really founded around that challenge, how to, how to build a non-viral gene therapy system that would be durable, years long per dose, um, redosable many times as, as normal drugs would be, and ultimately scalable, both to reach the global demands of rare indications, but also uh, potentially to move beyond rare indications into quite prevalent ones. And um, as it's turned out, uh, to do that, to unlock that challenge has required novel technology in three areas uh, that really have needed to be tightly integrated. And so the company was founded around closed-ended DNA or SADNET, which is a linear double-stranded covalently closed-ended uh, DNA construct with ITRs derived from AAV on each end. And um, SADNET solves two out of three of those challenges in an important way. First, it translocates from the cytoplasm to the nucleus by itself. So it doesn't need capsid to do that. And secondly, when it's in the nucleus, it drives long-term, uh, we think years long expression at very high levels. And thirdly, uh, it's amenable to really large scale production. So it can be made in a eukaryotic cell-based system that can be scaled up to 20,000 liters uh, and one that allows for sedna to be isolated through lysis of the producer cell lines, which gives you a high degree of granular control over quality and characterization. That it turns out that those two solution sets uh, are important and they're necessary, but they're not enough. And, and where we've really spent the last two and a half years is in inventing a new class of lipid nanoparticle delivery system that allows us to deliver this DNA uh, construct to target cells of interest using biologic targeting. And it turns out that that's a unique challenge that has to be solved for the delivery of DNA quite discreet from what's needed in a delivery system for mRNA or siRNA. And as a consequence of that third part of the platform, it's allowed us to go after systemic targets like the liver. Um, but because the targeting is driven by a biological ligand, it opens another dimension for us to consider bringing LNPs beyond the liver to the retina, to skeletal muscle, to oncology applications. So, you know, while we're at a very early preclinical stage compared to where um, Avro and Prevail are today, our ambition is to move in three dimensions. One, to deliver larger payloads, allowing us to go after novel diseases or potentially also um, multi-cystronic constructs where we're delivering, for example, antibodies. To move from rare to prevalent diseases on the basis of industrial uh, manufacturing scale. And finally, to unfold that kind of potential iteratively through a variety of tissues on the basis of this targeted delivery system. So we're really in this early stage, the front end of that 30 year journey, and we're moving from, from mice to, uh, to monkeys and then hope to be entering the clinic in the 22, 23 timeframe. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, all of you. I think that was a great introduction covered a lot of ground. And to, I guess to get more into sort of blending uh, or comparing and contrasting what you guys said. Um, I was curious about the, the sweet spots in terms of therapeutic areas and uh, different attributes or features of the technologies that you're using respectively. And Asa, you got into some of it, uh, why AAV is the best uh, vehicle right now for neurodegenerative diseases, but um, could you maybe go into a little more detail about the specific attributes or even some of the uh, perhaps concerns that others would have associated with AAV delivery? And you're on mute again. Thanks, um, absolutely. So yeah, uh, AAV9 uh, for, for, for the types of indications we're, we're talking about for neurodegenerative disorders, um, is, is really um, the only platform that we felt we could move forward with 
uh, to the clinic at this point. And, and so first and, and probably foremost is this remarkable ability to buy distribute, right? So this is a naturally occurring vector that's non-pathogenic and has evolved to be able to just very broadly distribute around the CNS. Um, and, and even again, a, a one-time uh, intravenous injection uh, can, can tr transduce, can, can deliver a gene to a majority of the cells in the CNS remarkably. Uh, and then with CSF delivery, a, a spinal tap essentially, uh, it's, the, the process is much more efficient and effective. Uh, which is which is what we do. So, um, so the the first point is just the need for an efficient way to broadly distribute um, a, a biological product around the CNS. And this this problem goes way beyond gene therapy. This is probably the you know the biggest problem for developing neurological drugs for the last couple decades. Um, just how do you get them there, essentially? And and AV9 is really in a way the first. Um, I think uh, meaningful solution uh, for that, that that we think is viable in, in this patient population. So, um, so, so that's the, the first point. And then uh, certainly safety uh, is, is, is a, is a you know, obvious consideration here and just the safety record of having hundreds of patients uh, you know, we believe over 500 patients dose, and particularly uh, with local delivery, with CSF delivery, um, uh, there's there's a very um, very impressive safety safety record across different uh, different programs out there. Um, so I, I think you know, and then I, I mentioned a little bit also about the just durability. And again, this is it's so interesting because in the liver uh, there are challenges. Uh, with, with with AV, uh, with durability, but in the CNS, uh, probably because there's less turnover, perhaps for other reasons we can talk about, but uh, certainly durability has been remarkable and we've seen very clear durability consistent with other other programs. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, those are uh, probably the, uh, I think the, the key, um, the key aspects here that drove us. Um, yeah, there, there's absolutely limitations, right? So pretty, uh, for instance, with AVs, you have less control into exactly which cells in the CNS we deliver to, um, and you may not get every type of cell. So for some indications, that's going to be a problem. But in our case, both for delivering glucosidase to GBA1 gene or progranulin, um, these, there's, uh, these are broadly expressed in different cell types, so we don't exactly have that as, a, as an imperative. And, and also, critically important is that both, in both cases, you have cross-correction. You have a degree of secretion and uptake, um, and th that's very well established. And that's very uh, helpful for us, because it means we don't have to get every single cell. Uh, and so... Uh, th those aspects mean make it make it okay not to be able to target specific cell types. Um, you know, with with AVs in general, you will get an adaptive immune response when you inject the vector to, to the capsid. This is transient; it lasts for a few weeks. It certainly uh, can be well managed with with uh, immunosuppression, um, but the but the exact amount of immunosuppression um, is always a uh, something that has to be uh, optimized and and uh, something we've we've been doing, but in in general, um, in fact, that's it. That clearly is effective, and and in fact, um, there's very promising studies that show that uh, with with immunosuppression uh, through delivery, there's even the opportunity to redose, which which is potentially an issue, but again, less of an issue in the CNS where you seem to have uh, very good. Uh, persistence. Um, so, you know, so I, I think those are, you know, so, some of sort of the balance here, and I think it underscores why, why we use different, you know, why we're using different technologies here. Yeah. And um, does either of the Jeffs, uh, do you want to chime in with uh, the sweet spots of uh, your, yeah, your so I, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, 
And, and I think it's a bit of a backward story at, at Avro is that we didn't do what many do is, is identify a, a set of diseases and you know, ask what is the appropriate vector. It, it was backwards. And, and it was really because um, myself and my two co-founders really had a, a lifelong heritage in the ex vivo world. You know, and, and so we, we started with a bias that we, our skill set uh, was very much driven by our, our comfort that we felt we could build the technical skill set to advance an ex vivo lenti gene therapy company. So, you know, when, when, and, and back in 2015, it just seemed like the time to do it. You know, I mean, Carl and Bruce were curing cancer at UPenn and our neighbors down the street, Bluebird, were showing curative data with ex vivo lenti. So it just felt like, okay, the, you know, the technology is valid, but it's a very know-how intensive field. And we happen to have some of those skill sets and we can backfill what, what we don't have. So that, that was the premise. And then, you know, step one was open up the big book of medicine and try to find diseases that fit lenti. And, you know, to say it simply, our thought process then, and actually it's our thought process today in 2020 as well, um, was that the sweet spot for Lenti is that when what is required is that lifelong distribution of an active protein, meaning full systemic distribution above and below the neck, um, including into what we call these hard to reach compartments. And the obvious one would be, would be CNS. And we're motivated by some of the data that you know, our, our colleagues at now Orchard had shown an MLD and, you know, our, our neighbors, Bluebird and cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. So, you know, with that sort of as the guiding post, we actually didn't find much in the big book of medicine. So we actually got out and, you know, just trolled around academic institutions looking for collaborators where there was already a substantial amount of preclinical data that showed that, you know, th these weren't science projects. These were things that were ready to translate. And in the early year or so of 2015 into 16, we just partnered with academics and rolled up assets that fit that tight profile. So by starting with that, it got us to, you know, Jeff, generation Jeff's old uh, genzyme indications, the lysosomal disorders, because of course it was really motivating to see that delivering an exogenous enzyme could do some good. And if you looked at the patient outcomes before ERT versus after ERT, it was dramatic. So an incredible proof of concept. And yet I think everyone would acknowledge the pharmacokinetics are poor. You know, that you, you have a biweekly infusion of an enzyme. And yet if you test the blood 12 hours after infusion, it's gone. It works at all because some of it gets taken up intracellularly, but the majority is processed by the liver and wasted. So we felt that that was really a nice application for ex vivo gene therapy, because if, if we could produce even low levels of an enzyme systemically 24 seven to bathe the cells, tissues, organs, we felt we would be at the very least providing a better pharmacokinetic delivery of an exogenous, of, of an enzyme. And so that, that's really what we set out to do. And when we honed in on Fabry, we just continued. And I, I think that um, 2015 and 16 was still at that opportunistic phase where you know, there was enough clinical validation to get excited, but, but still a lot of opportunity to collaborate with academics that had spent 10 or 15 years of their life, getting it to the point where it was ready to hand off to a company like us. So that, that was our approach. Right. So I think in a, just to round it on in a similar way, uh, we were starting with a, a very broad platform technology approach we had a very specific set of attributes that we wanted to create with the platform. Uh, and on the basis of those, the indication selection became quite natural. Um, we today have uh, eight clinical programs or clinical targets, let's say, uh, five in the liver and, and three in the retina. I'll just confine, you know, for the purposes of this answer, uh, the perspective to the liver, which as Asa pointed out, is a systemic target. It's a an organ that remains mitotic throughout life. It's highly mitotic in childhood. Uh, so the ability to get to the right dose for all patients and to extend efficacy through redosing has particular advantages for the liver. And of course, it goes without saying, there's a whole laundry list of intrinsic liver diseases that have a genetic basis that can be addressed through broad biodistribution to hepatocytes. And also, you can use the liver as a biofactory to address systemic diseases. So it's not surprising that our two lead indications are PKU and hemophilia A, PKU being a great uh, proof of concept indication for an intracellular disease and hemophilia A being one where we can elaborate uh, a protein for systemic 
um, therapeutic purposes. You know, I think the um, uh, sweet spot, if you will, for the application of the technology, um, you know, really sits at two quite uh, um, opposing poles therapeutically. On one hand, uh, one of the limitations of addressing genetic disease in the liver, particularly with um, AAV, is that you can really only dose once. And as a consequence, you have to pick the highest uh, tolerated dose and give the same dose to all patients. And um, because the liver is so mitotic early in, in life, you're really uh, forced to take that shot quite late. So in, in kids who are 16 years of age or older at the moment. And uh, of course, the best day of every child's life with a genetic disease is the day they're born. And as they grow, they lose uh, function and, and uh, wellness. So our ambition on the one pole is to be able to dose all eligible kids as close to birth as possible to repeat dosing every three weeks using biomarkers until we know that their individualized level of expression is appropriate, and then to boost their doses as the liver grows through grade school, and in the most aspirational case, send those kids to college with little connection to the disease they were born with. And I think a redosable, titratable the liver nucleic acid to the nucleus has that, that potential. The other poll that we're really interested in playing for is just this broad concept, as, as Jeff was saying, of allowing the body to elaborate its own proteins for therapeutic benefit. And you know, our sense is that in the very largest indications, using the liver as a biofactory could actually even extend the reach of, of current biologics. Passively manufacturing and delivering biologics to patients every three weeks or every six weeks or three months imposes a certain scale limitation as opposed to being able to allow patients to make their own uh, biologics over time. So we see, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, delivering the genes to create antibody therapeutics uh, to patients using our technology uh, as a way to even expand the reach of current biologics. So from very rare, very early to, you know, much larger, more mainstream diseases, these are the two uh, sweet spots where we hope to build on the foundation of what's there today. Right. And so, I guess with AAV, uh, we all are sort of more familiar with what the inherent limitations are, whether it's gene size or the things that uh, that Asa was mentioning about uh, cell types and all. But so with uh, Lenti and non-viral, have you begun to see, I guess, some of the inherent design limitations, things that it just can't do uh, or areas it just isn't, quote, quite suited to go? Well, I, you know, I, I think that um, we do, we do do see two limitations. And I think, you know, the, the nice thing about Lenti is, you know, we have our own issues to deal with, but what, what we don't have to deal with are like liver toxicity issues, immunogenicity, or the, you know, the declining durability topics that have been, you know, so newsworthy recently. You know, the, the challenges with Lenti, um, for an integrating vector are, are very, very different. And, you know, I think the first one is that it's a complex business model. It is, you know, that we have to take the patient's blood, select out the patient's own unique stem cells, give their own unique stem cells an upgrade, cryopreserve the product, ship it back, you know, and so each, each patient is a personalized medicine experience. So that, that's, you know, it, it's manageable, but it's a logistical issue. And then the second issue relates to patient tolerability, not of the gene therapy, but of the concomitant conditioning regimen. And, and this is an area that, you know, as, all, as is often the case, you know, when you're seeing the, the really impressive set of efficacy data that is emerging in Lenti, now there's just a pouring of energy units towards improving the patient experience with the concomitant conditioning regimen. And just to give some people some backdrop is because we infuse the, the patient's own gene modified cells back into the patient just prior to that a day or two prior we need to implement a conditioning regimen to create space primarily in the bone marrow for these gene modified cells to have a home to be able to adequately engraft because if that doesn't happen you don't get that long-term durability so the focus right now is how do you improve the tolerability profile of that conditioning regime and there's immediate term answers to that, which is 
really um, instead of what was used historically in bone marrow transplant, which is sort of a polypharmacy approach of combining cyclophosphamide with a higher dose of busulfan without AUC monitoring and targeting patients that have already had multiple chemo rounds and patients that come into the equation with impaired bone marrow. Instead of doing that, what we're really trying to pioneer now and seeing very good early results is a single agent conditioning regimen, a single cycle, mid-range dose, tight AUC monitoring is, is half the story. And the other half of the story is targeting patients that come in to the equation with healthy liver, healthy immune system, and healthy bone marrow. And what emerges out of that equation is an adverse event profile that is you know, significantly improved versus you know, some of the conventional bone marrow outcomes of, of the past. So I, I think it's that personalized medicine and it's continuing to push the patient tolerability forward related to the conditioning regime. And I think many of us are also aware that there are companies that are working on next generation conditioning regimes such as Magenta and others. And of course their success is only gonna help the field go forward as well. Yeah, I guess I, guess I would answer the question um, a little bit. Uh, Inside out in our case, Hanover, I think you know the, the field of non-viral gene deliveries. It's a it's a puzzle you know that needs to be put together, and and the minimal set is this combination of durable expression in the nucleus, redosing, and tissue specific delivery on a basis of of scalable manufacturing, and and each time you put that together, it's it's fit for purpose for a given tissue or cell type. So you know for us. Uh, cracking that equation, if you will, for the liver and the retina unlocks a certain uh, set of targets and, and opportunities, but we haven't cracked that uh, set of equations uh, to ASA's point for the CNS. That's just a very difficult thing to do, and, and we have lots of aspirations to, to do that and to unlock other tissues, but we haven't done it yet. So, you know, our goal is to have a, a low therapeutic hurdle to administer our platform in any given tissue but we will expand only as and when we have a tissue or cell specific way to target and access and broadly biodistribute in, in each tissue. So, you know, I think that's a, it's just about moving through a set of opportunity spaces, but it's not like they all open up, you know, with, with, with one delivery system. The, the delivery system is cell specific in a given tissue and you move one at a time. Right. And um, average effort is really, I wanted to go back to something you said, and I was really glad you brought it up, um, which is about the business model of, and really how you move uh, the, the cell material, the gene material through uh, the whole process. And I was curious, so for each of uh, the technologies that you use, what's the current infrastructure like for manufacturing these vectors? Like what, how do you manufacture them and what's like the cost, the speed, um, and really the, the whole picture, the intensity of it. Um, and I guess, uh, Generation Jeff, why don't you uh, start? Uh, or any of you can, uh, can you hear me? Amber, I, I lost you at the end of your question. I, oh. I thought maybe you said my name, sorry. Can you <laughs> oh, yes. oh. rewind, oh. sorry. Yeah, rewind. Sorry. Yeah, uh, just uh, if you can start by uh, start to talk about your process at Generation, that'd be good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the part where they said, "Please speak, Generation Jeff," is of course where I missed you. Sorry for that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know every every technology has a series of problems to solve, and those problems uh, at the cutting edge usually are about safety and efficacy first. But I think the X factor that all of us are are aiming to get to is uh, a place where we can make our therapies as broadly available as possible. And, and one of the elements in that X factor, of course, is just how much it costs to make them. Uh, and that has been straightforwardly a, a very significant limitation for biologics to date. We are nowhere near reaching the full penetration curve of what the demand could or should be globally for biologics. And of course, we're a long way from reaching that uh, from the perspective of, of gene therapy of any kind. I mean, all genetic medicines are at the, the front end of that curve. So, 
you know, I think uh, one of the elements that we're um, really interested in and have invested heavily behind is the concept of non-viral production. Um, and in one way, there's nothing very fancy about that. Uh, you know, cell-based production is something that's used routinely for biologics. So if you could imagine greatly reducing the effective dose of a biologic and extending its duration of action in the liver, for example, to five years, you can naturally see you get a very large multiplier on production capacity on a biologics basis. So, you know, for the um, specific case of Generation Bio, producing Sedna in biologics infrastructure, never using sort of a, a, a viral system along the way, it gives you the same access to large scale manufacturing as current biologics uh, enjoy, specifically upstream scale up to 20,000 liters one-to-one -one downstream processing and high flow drug product uh, production. Um, and you know, our, our view of that all the way through the supply chain is that we'll be selecting for each indication a minimally clinically relevant dose. And then titration occurs through redosing. So there's something quite um, economical about that approach to both dosing and, and the supply chain that we hope will lead us to a place where payers can pay a more drug-like cost with a better ability to predict both durability through redosing as well as patient-specific efficacy also through redosing at the initiation of therapy. So, so that's, that's kind of the ambition and, and it's what the technology platform allows us to play for. But still, there's lots to do in terms of process refinement and tech transfer and scaling and all the normal things that apply to, to the biologics world. So how are you doing it today, actually? Well, we, we've invested over the last three years to essentially in, invent and refine the process for our specific construct, both on the drug substance and on the drug product side. So in other words, creating the nucleic acid construct, characterizing, purifying, and then ultimately formulating in the lipid nanoparticle. So we own all of the kind of know-how and, and intellectual property by, behind how to do that. And we've had the ambition to maintain control over that at a development scale and at quite a, a, an advanced research scale. But we've actively tech transferred that to GMP CMOs, um, a couple of them, in order to be able to access existing scale in those systems. And you know, I'm, Asa, I'm sure you, you would relate to this. It's just super competitive. There's, not, it, there's an immature base of, of viral manufacturing capacity globally today and it's hard to kind of compete and get yourself in there. Um, it, it's quite the opposite from the perspective of biologics capacity. So we feel good about having a distributed uh, supply chain model now that we've been able to tech transfer the process to a couple of different CMOs on that basis. So it's a mixed internal and external model. Yeah. So Asa, over to you for the, I guess the flip side of that story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, absolutely. This is a, a huge focus, um, and and uh, particularly for us, in part because it is a place that people have been tripped up along the way, and in part because we are interested in what are ultimately some really large patients. You know, gene therapy has mostly been focused uh, on on quite rare indications, but uh, you know, uh, Parkinson's Parkinson's GBA. There's 100,000 or so Americans, right? So these are significant populations. Um, but again, it's, 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 it's a critical aspect, of course, of, of moving forward. And, and um, so, so we um, have intensively built in-house process development, analytical development over the last um, two years or, or so. For, and, and we actually have two platforms that serve different purposes. We have sort of an early to clinic platform for our phase one, two material that's allowed us to move. You know, we have three open active INDs uh, with two clinical stage products. And it's really because we have that platform. That's a HEC-293 transient transfection adherent system. Uh, it's, it's uh, it's effective, it's well-established, and it's outsourceable. Um, and so, uh, so we've been pleased with that. But at the same time, we have all along the way uh, really focused on developing a uh, late clinical and commercial platform. And that um, based really on the data we've, we've, we've uh, 
generated, uh, we decided to focus on a baculovirus-based system, um, as have a number of other groups. Now, baculovirus uh, is, you know, is, is uh, a good example of a, you know, some place where uh, you really need to develop the processes in-house, as, as Jeff said, and uh, you, it's, this is not something that one can readily, uh, I think, outsource. So we developed the processes, uh, both uh, and, and, and the analytics, really, for this, and um, and and have, have gone quite a quite a ways now, and and are completely really on track to have this platform uh, ready when we need uh, material for, for pivotal studies for both of these. Programs and and so the back of our platform is it does have remarkable scalability. It's, it's uh, more than 10x uh, the you know, the other platforms that we've compared this to, and and that's also evident from other people's experience. But but beyond that, what we found is that uh, the quality and even the scale of the the comparability um, uh, at scale it, it really stands out with with this back of our platform. So, um, and, and we've started to detail this, uh, won't, won't go into that here necessarily, but um, really uh, looks, looks very promising. But no question, this is um, absolutely critical for moving, uh, for moving forward with these programs. They have, we, we have to have programs that, that, uh, that, can, you know, that can deliver to, to large patient populations. And do you find yourself actually competing for space uh, with with the parts that are outsourceable? Um, yeah, not 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 really. So we so we uh, we develop the processes, we own the processes, but we uh, then have partnered with uh, Lanza actually for for the brick and mortar GMP manufacturing, and that's that's worked well for us at this point. Um, but we we have the flexibility. Uh, to to take other approaches, and we we are constantly evaluating that. This is this this model works really well for us right now. It's uh, allowed us to move this quickly, but but absolutely, as we move forward, that's going to be an issue. But it, at this very point in time, uh, we're we're happy with where we are. And and so, Averjet, for you, um, do you find yourself closer to either of uh, ASA or, or generation? Well, I mean, so some of the principles, I think our, our technology is, is of course different, but the idea of prioritizing process development, I think that, that this is really the nucleus of what we think is our core advantage and really why we founded the company, because we, we really felt that the starting point was incredible science, but almost like an open manual Petri dish manufacturing process. And so the, the first step was really to lay out the entire, you know, um, value chain and, and ask what are the bits that really are value add that we need or want to be the best in the world at? And what can we rely on partners? And I think that, and, and equally importantly, what has to be done be before you get into the clinic? And what can you do via these uh, in vitro comparability process changes as, as we go? And, and of course, in our world, stem cell quality needs to be sorted up front, cryopreservation needs to be sorted up front. But then we were able to, as we got into the clinic, um, have pre-IND meetings and propose some um, process changes. And there were some critical things that we had to get in place in order to deliver on our vision of a cost-effective, highly scalable global product. And one was optimizing our vector, you know, such that you know, it, it is really tunable to manufacturing by adjusting the multiplicity of infection. We could push the BCN and we could have a titer of 10 to the ninth. Secondly, be able to manufacture in large bioreactors. And one day this won't be considered large, but a 200 free, 200 liter serum free suspension bioreactor. So with the titer I mentioned, that means each run can produce enough drug product for treat 50 patients. And so, you know, a single run can uh, meet the needs of the entire Fabry clinical development program, for example. And it's pretty easy to do the math that if we have four suites, 12 runs per suite, 50 patients per run, you then can treat thousands of patients in a year. And if you needed to double that, go to eight suites. So we, we really do believe now today 
with the high titer and the large bioreactors that we've turned the vector into what it always should be, which is a long lead time critical raw material. You need to think about it and plan for it, but it's not on the critical path to hold us back. But we have the second issue of manufacturing cell-based drug product. And, and that's really the third innovation for us. And maybe the biggest is to be able to manufacture in a fully automated closed system. And the, the beauty of that is now that all of Fabry and all of Gauche and soon the rest of our portfolio is manufactured in these small automated pods about the size of a dishwasher, they are themselves a fully enclosed clean room. So what it does is it increases scale immediately tenfold because you could have 10 little pods in the same low grade clean room rather than being able to only manufacture one at a time. So scale is one advantage, but the, the, maybe the more important benefit for us is we now have picked up these pods and put them in CMOs in Australia, in California, in Houston, and in, in a quarter or two in Europe. And they have the same proprietary Avro algorithm. So if you hit the go button in Houston or in Melbourne, you get the same drug product out, out at the end. And, and so for us, this technological solution has enabled us to increase scale and to globalize at an early time. And, you know, of course, for biological facilities, it, it's, if, you, if you want to manufacture someone else, you have all of those challenges of validation here because it is a fully closed system. It's just a matter of doing some engineering runs to validate and then we can produce in a different geography. So we, we, we do think that, you know, we've approached this with, with technological innovation as the driver, as opposed to saying, let's build the big bricks and mortar and, and occupy every step. So now that we've done the process development, we have the vector, we have the bioreactors and we have the automation, we do house them in CMOs around the world. Right. So manufacturing efficiency is certainly a, a big part of, um, I guess, driving down the cost as Generation Jeff was alluding to. But um, do you all agree that it is the, the like one of the biggest contributing factors? What are the other things that you think are driving costs? And ultimately, how long will it really take as, as an in industry, as a field to uh, get prices down to uh, a level that's fair and reasonable and affordable for patients? Well, I mean, I, I could start with the fair and reasonable because, of course, the, the, what we would invite the, the view to be is rational and to look at what the cost offset is. Because, of course, you know, the, the lifetime cost of a Fabry patient's standard of care today is 12 to $14 million. And the fact that it's biweekly infusions is, is one thing. So then what would be value-based? You know, I think if, it, if a gene therapy negates the need for that 12 to $14 million, and isn't looking for the full cost offset of that 12 or $14 million is looking for a small fraction of it. You know, I, I would think that that falls into the fair and reasonable. And I think most of the field has embraced some of the methodologies of groups like ICER and NICE, which are, you know, on one hand, looking at five-year cost offsets, and then are, are there any other, you know, real value measures? So, you know, I, I think that, you know, sometimes we use the term value-based pricing we're not asking for value-based pricing because the value would get you up to what today's standard of care is, is asking where no matter what, this will save the healthcare system an absolute fortune if we hit our target product profile of a safe, effective therapy. So I recognize society, of course, has the question, you know, are they going to be able to make the mental leap to, you know, look at the holistic costs and the potential savings. But our hope would be that there's, there's some way to, uh, to, you know, have a, a rational solution. And I think the payers are, are being very productive in proposing some now. Okay. Asa, what's, what's your take with, I mean, your AAV um, has currently the two approved uh, gene therapies on the market, they're AAV based. So where do you see that going? Yeah, so it, look, it, I'd say, first of all, we're, we're at a phase one, two, uh, yeah, and we treated a handful of patients. So I, I think it really is premature probably to talk um, in any detail about pri pricing, I think at this point. And, um, you know, I think uh, over the next two, three years, uh, and as Jeff mentioned, this, some of this, for, you know, fortunately, I think will get worked out. And, um, 
and and look, these are what, what uh, the, the indications we're talking about. Uh, there are absolutely no treatments, and there's you know many many patients with Parkinson's, with you know, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, these are huge societal needs. Um, so this will get worked out um, in the next two three years. It'll certainly get worked out, I think, before we are. Um, you know, in a timely manner for us. The, the one other thing I would point out is that, um, you know, it, it, you know as, as, as I said before, with, with AVs and, and AV technologies, these have um, almost uh, uni universally been applied to rare and ultra rare indications. And, and that adds a layer of complexity, obviously with pricing. Um, it's obviously much more complicated to develop therapies uh, for ultra rare indications. We're doing something really different here when we talk about Parkinson's, uh, you, you know, even the, the GPA subpopulation of Parkinson's, you know, there's nine, you know, nine to 10 percent of Parkinson's patients in the U.S. have an underlying mutation in GPA1. So, uh, you know, 100,000 or so Americans. So, so the scale here is going to is going to matter and it's going to be helpful, I think, also. But, but you know, overall, I think it's, it's, it's still early days. Right. And I guess it's even earlier days for Generation Jeff, but um, how, I guess by the time you go to market, how do you foresee or envision uh, where we will be? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear um, the view of, of uh, Asa and Jeff that the pairs uh, will be constructed. They've already demonstrated that they want to be constructed. I, I think the broader question is really a societal one, right? As, as these technologies start to, to more fully meet the global need for rare diseases and also to penetrate uh, into prevalent diseases, um, the, the only aspect that hasn't been mentioned I think is important to keep in mind is payers also want security. So I think one of the biggest challenges that's been there for systemic gene therapy is not knowing how long it will last. So how do you really deal with that when you're being asked to pay a lot up front, but not knowing, you know, whether you'll get the, the, the effect you want, and if you do get it, how long will it last? So I think security is another component. Um, and I do think that some of these other aspects will help to alleviate uh, some of the pressure that budget impact plays. And budget impact has killed many appropriate paying, you know, mechanisms and, and fully fair and reasonable pricing, you know, approaches just because of the reality of having to manage an annual budget. So, you know, there's there's a theoretical part to this and then there's just a, a reality of how, how payers uh, work. So, you know, I think this will be a, a dialogue probably as long as any of us will be in the business. Right. So I think we're right about uh, at the end of our allotted hour, but before we go, um, I thought I, I wanted all of you to maybe pitch in on what just one thing, one big thing that remains to be done for patients on each of the platforms that you're still trying to address, like a priority or an open area. Um, and so just, I guess, real quick, we'll, you have like less than one minute each. But. Yeah, so I, I, I can go first. I mean, I, I think that at the point in time we're at for Fabry, just as an example, we, we have nine patients worth of data. We're pretty happy with it. So our thoughts are turned less to how do we get into the clinic to how do we get out of the clinic and less about just registration, but broad label. And also to address what we just talked about, having a compelling economic health policy rationalization. So we're, we're actually expanding our clinical development program very significantly to address label issues, not approval issues. So, you know, young, old, male, female, mutation, independent, naive, switch. So it, it, it really has had a, a significant shift in everything that we're doing in clinical development because it wasn't very long ago, we were just you know, trying to show that we're seeing an effect. And I think now we're, we're thinking, okay, we're, we're bullish enough on that, but now what does it look like outside the clinic, which is a very different question. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think this is a, yeah, tremendously exciting time is what I'd say. I'm, I'm a neurologist and um, have taken care of a lot of patients with these disorders, uh, you know, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, 
ALS front and terminal dementia. And um, what we need to do now is, is, is really move forward is what I would say. I mean, we have, um, you know, we, we have a technology that works um, in terms of delivering uh, the genes that people, you know, that these patients need. And, you know, there's nothing available. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty uh, tough, right, uh, for, for patients and for families having no, you know, no, no therapies available whatsoever. And it's, uh, and it's important for the clinicians to have uh, sort of options as well. So, um, so we're, that's the stage we're at. We have, uh, you know, open active INDs now, and we're uh, screening patients and, and dosing. And uh, I think we just need to move forward. We'll, uh, you know, and, and the very early data we have is just uh, really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing, if you ask it that way, Amber, is to, you know, make real a day when getting these genes, the right genes to the right patient at the right dose repeatedly is completely and utterly routine. That, that's the goal, right? And we're all approaching it in, in a different way and, and aiming for different sweet spots. But we'd like this kind of lifelong uh, gene replacement um, to just to become a, a routine reality in the way that you put gas in your car. That, that's what we're aiming for. When that happens, we can hang up the cleats and go home. Indeed, you are so right. <laughs> it's been fun to be on the, on the panel with you guys. Thank you. And Amber, thanks for bringing us together, too. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, thank you. That's a great way to end. Um, and really appreciate your time. Uh, all the best for what you do. Great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Take care.